Well, this evening we're studying uh, basically how we can use uh, the end of the world scenarios to our advantage in seeking to uh, bring other people to the Lord Jesus Christ. And just by way of review, remember there's, um, I think we've already seen that in just about every age, and actually if you went out and, and talked to different people, you'd probably find out pretty soon there's somebody is concerned or everybody is concerned about something. They're concerned about something that seems to be threatening their lives. Uh, they're concerned about some kind of situation in the world, whether it's economic meltdown or whether it happens to be the Mayan calendar. In just about every, um, well, every time frame, there's something that somebody's been concerned about. If it hasn't been something uh, that is powerful enough to destroy the world, they've been concerned that the Lord is, is going to be coming again. So, I don't know, it seems like just about everybody thinks the world is going to end in their lifetime. Again, we saw several things that, that um, people were concerned about over the years, but the one we've been looking at in particular has been the Mayan calendar, which we've already dealt with. But uh, we also saw last week that the Bible actually tells us that the world really can't come to an end yet. Remember that uh, that's a rather significant event, I think, in uh, the um, unfolding of God's plan. And certainly, remember the Lord says through Amos the prophet, the Lord does nothing unless he reveals his secret counsel to his servants, the prophets. Now, what are some of the things we looked at that indicated that the end of the world really can't come yet? Can you think of any of the things we looked at uh, last, last time we were studying uh, this topic? Kathy? Okay, now, <clears throat> he hasn't gathered all of his elect. If he had, what would happen? What's that? He would, he would return. So we know he hasn't gathered all of his elect yet, and I think the key thing of what you just said was he hasn't gathered them from every tribe, nation, tongue, and kindred, which he uh, says that he's going to do, um, Revelation 5.9. And they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seal, for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. Now it appears from this that there has to be some of the Lord's elect from every people group in the world. And every people group hasn't been reached yet, which means the end can't come yet. Was there anything else that we looked at that indicated his coming may be a ways off yet? Yeah. Exactly. The, the father has made a promise to the son that he is going to defeat all of his enemies and bring them into subjection under his feet. 1 Corinthians 15, 25 through 26, for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be abolished is death. So unless we conceive of the fulfillment of this passage as basically all the enemies thriving, and then just before the Lord comes to vanquish the last enemy death, he sort of flattens them all at one time. Uh, this is something that, that is an ongoing process and something, there, well, there's still plenty of enemies in the world yet to be subdued. So until these enemies are subdued, the Lord can't return. And there, again, there's, there's still plenty of them. Can you think of anything else that kind of goes along these lines that indicates that the Lord's coming might yet be... Uh, a little ways off, were you? Okay. Yes, yeah, so we did see passages that indicate that um, as as the enemies are subdued, and they begin to give feigned obedience uh, to the Lord that um, it's going to bring about a change of, of condition in the world. There's going to be a blessing. We didn't focus a great deal on that. We actually had to scoot through quite a bit last time. But um, that, that one is, is debatable among uh, differing um, you know, people with differing views. Uh, we looked at the differing views. We saw kind of what their views are. Um, historic pre expects everything just to get increasingly worse, but they do see after the second coming, a thousand years it follows Christ's coming. We don't really have time to deal with that, but they see that being a golden age. I'm sorry, that wasn't historic pre-mill. Was, I, I guess it would be the same for dispensational and historic pre-mill. 
for the awe mill, we are in the, the uh, millennium and, and the post mill also for the most part agrees and the second coming when that happens, the eternal state comes. So there's no golden age here. In the awe mill position, there's really no golden age anywhere. In the post mill, the golden age would take place somewhere within that millennial time frame. Some post mills believe the millennium is the golden age, so that has not yet uh, started. So that is one possible argument. If, in fact, the Bible says things are going to get better before the Lord comes, if there is a golden age, we haven't seen it yet. Uh, so we would expect to see that, and it would be an extended period of time before the Lord returns. Now, there's one other thing, too, that kind of goes along with the, uh, the kingdom of heaven, uh, or I should say the, um, uh, the elect being gathered from every nation, and that is uh, how big is the kingdom supposed to get? Well, pretty big, yes, but how big in terms of, the, okay, it's, it's going to fill the earth. Uh, not every nation has been reached because the kingdom of heaven hasn't filled the earth, and even once it reaches to a particular nation, it still has to have its effect in there uh, before we might say that it, well, it comes under the dominion of the kingdom of heaven, which is what the parable of the mustard seed appears to indicate by the birds of the heaven nesting under its branches. But... Remember Daniel 2, verse 35, Nebuchadnezzar has the, the dream, the uh, statue and the, the stone cut without hands that smashes the feet and the statue falls over, is crushed, uh, wind blows it away, all that's left is the stone, the stone grows into a great mountain that fills the whole earth. Uh, that is the kingdom of Christ that was going to be set up in the days of those kings. It's eventually going to fill the entire earth. And since it's not a political kingdom, since it's not one that's uh, driven by military force or has a physical presence and with cities and so forth, it's basically a spiritual kingdom. It means that it's going to fill and influence the entire world, even as the parable of the uh, leaven indicates, where the kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which is introduced into the three measures of meal until it's all leavened. Okay, so there's the idea of influence, there's the idea of the whole being leavened, there's the idea that uh, the kingdom of heaven is going to grow until it fills the whole earth. And there's also, of course, the Lord's Prayer where we're told to pray that every, well, basically his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. There's the Great Commission that indicates that, um, well, when Jesus says, go out and make disciples of all the nations, that um, the Lord's intending actually for that Great Commission to be fulfilled before he returns. So anyway, however we conceive of those things, they certainly tell us that more time is needed before Jesus can come. His coming cannot be imminent. I mean, it would be if all these conditions were fulfilled, then we'd be looking for him at any time. But since they haven't been, his coming really can't be imminent, which means it can't be just around the corner. It can't come tonight. It can't come in the next few seconds. Although I'd like to be wrong on that. I mean, it'd be nice if the Lord came, put an end to everything that we see, all the wickedness. I don't think it can because there are several scriptures that haven't yet been fulfilled. Now, that means that when Jesus was speaking to his disciples about what appeared to be an imminent return, uh, he couldn't have been talking about his second coming, right? I mean, it's 2,000 years later and he still hasn't come. And from our perspective, he still can't come tonight or tomorrow or anytime real soon because these other conditions haven't been met, which means that when he was speaking to his disciples about the fact that they should be ready because his coming was at the door, what was it referring to? What was he referring to? His coming in judgment in 70 AD. I, I don't think there's anything else he could have been talking about. And also the book of Revelation, the same kind of thing where he says that don't seal up the words of this prophecy because the time is near. Um, anyway, so that was near, but this is far away. What he was talking about was his coming in judgment. His second coming is still a ways off. So again, end of the world, that's, that's what we were looking at. Okay. All right, now let's ask this question. Um, when end of the world scenarios come, you and I know that there's nothing to worry about. That's kind of what the point of, of last week was about and the week before. Don't worry about the Mayan calendar. Even the Mayans weren't worried about it. And nobody, well, 
there are people worried about it today, but uh, they shouldn't be because the Mayans didn't think the world was going to end. But it doesn't matter whether they thought that they were or not because the Lord is not speaking through the Mayans, okay? But the idea is that uh, with all these things yet to come, we don't have to be concerned that Christ's coming is going to happen just yet, which means that the end of the world isn't going to come just yet, which will happen at his second coming. But how can we use end of the world scenarios to advance the kingdom of heaven? Well, let's ask this question. Why do these scenarios even happen? You know, why do they take place? Why do they come up? Does, is there anything that really happens outside of the will of God? Okay, obviously not, which means that the Lord must be willing that these things take place for a reason, it must be his will. Uh, there's a passage that's actually going to be used as our meditation this upcoming Lord's Day in Isaiah 46, verses 9 through 10. Listen to what uh, the Lord says here. He says, remember the former things long past, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is no one like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things which have not been done, saying, my purpose will be established and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. Now, basically, the Lord's in control. He can tell us what's going to happen at the end. He can tell us from the beginning to the end what's going to take place. He can declare it from ancient times because he has a plan. My purpose will be established. I will accomplish all my good pleasure. Nothing that happens in this world at all, nothing, is outside of the will of God. So if it is his will that end of the world scenarios crop up, why, why do you think that happens? What is the Lord seeking to do through those things? Ah, that sounds like it could be a very good uh, possibility that people could see through these things their mortality. Now, why would the Lord want people to see their mortality? Ah, now again, what is the Lord's purpose through everything that he has made and everything that he does? What's his one overarching goal? Okay, that, that people would be saved, okay? That, that's certainly, what's that? Maybe a little bit more. His people would be saved. Okay, his people would be saved. All right, that's true. And um, can we back up one step? Yes. Okay, certainly for his glory. And how is the Lord chosen to glorify himself? By saving his people, right? That's one way. There are actually two things we were focusing on in the morning services. Do you remember what the other one is? Jesus gets a reward, okay, for the work of redemption. Everything that the Lord has made is for the work of redemption. Everything that he does is to advance that work in some way, but there's two main things that he's doing. He's saving his people. Remember what revival advances? It advances the work of the kingdom of heaven. Okay, he's saving his people, and what's the other thing he's doing? I actually already talked about it tonight. Okay. All right, uh, well, there, there's two ways he adds to his kingdom. He, he, he saves some people, and, and what else does he do? Can you think of, maybe we haven't thought of it in these terms. Okay, he certainly punishes them. He, and he doesn't just punish them, but what else does he get them to do? He gets them to submit, right? Okay. He, remember, the, the, the Father is, has given Jesus control of the entire world. He's seated at his right hand, and all power and authority in heaven and earth has been given to him. Now, does that mean that he's got all that power, but nobody needs to recognize that power? Uh-oh. What timing? <laughs> okay. Now, he, he has that power, and those who are saved uh, willingly submit to that, but the rest of them need to recognize it and submit to it as well, right? Isn't that what it means when, when the Father gives the Son the promise that all of his enemies will be subdued under his feet? 
and the idea of them giving feigned obedience and that every knee shall bow in heaven and earth and under the earth. Okay, that's a promise given to the Lord. And as his kingdom advances, not only do you have those willingly bowing the knee, but you have those, I suppose you'd say in a certain sense they're willing, but um, they're willing that they not be destroyed. And so they, they submit, okay? So there's, there's a couple of different things going on here. The, as far as the, the overarching thing that the Lord is doing is he's advancing the kingdom of Christ. And as he does, he is bringing people in. This other part of his subduing his enemies is almost entirely overlooked by a majority of the church, but he is doing that too. I mean, that, that is the promise that was given to the son. Now, how would end of the world scenarios advance that particular cause or those two particular things? Now, you already mentioned that um, when, when something like this happens, it, it does cause people to become agitated. What are the things they... Uh, Donna? What are the, I would say that when people are aware of that, that right now, there's so many people that are denying the existence of God, that they would come to a point where they would have to come to the Right. Fear is something when people get into the situation, people who did not believe in God suddenly begin to believe in God, right? Uh, they actually, I guess if we want to modify that biblically, what we'd have to say is this, they always believed in God, but now they're forced to admit it. And they're, they're going to admit it because they are afraid because they're insecure, because they think they're going to die. I mean, isn't that what happens in end of the world scenarios? World's going to end, I'm going to die, am I ready for death? Now, of course, it doesn't take an end of the world scenario for that to happen. That can happen whenever somebody thinks they're going to die, right? Now, what do we, what do we call it when somebody is suddenly um, uh, willing to admit and suddenly concerned about the condition of their soul? Yes, right. Okay, awakening. And what is it that has to happen before we can really begin to minister the gospel to people? They have to be what? Yeah. Okay. Right, so they have to be aware of, of their danger, right? And um, I think end of the world scenarios can help us in that regard, can't they? Because they can wake people up to concern for their souls. I mean, why are they concerned? It's because they don't know what is ahead. They don't know what's going to happen. And they don't, well, actually, they do in a certain sense, and they're afraid because their conscience tells them that they've sinned and there is judgment. So those things exist, okay? When, when people are faced with death, they become concerned. They become somewhat awakened. They become a person who may listen to what you have to say. By the way, um, what, what else typically, well, there's a lot of different things that can bring that about, but what's one thing in particular that can do that? Death. death. If somebody that you know dies, or if you're faced with death, okay, that can happen. So anyway, <clears throat> end of the world scenarios or anything that makes a person afraid can uh, make them more susceptible, can make them uh, open to Okay, the, the gospel. Now, let's think about, hi, let's think about how we might be able to use that. We're, we're looking at, uh, uh, this evening we're looking at um, how end of the world scenarios can wake people up to their danger and uh, make them more susceptible to the gospel, okay? So this is how, I mean, basically this is how we can use uh, end of the world scenarios to advance the kingdom of heaven. Again, why does the Lord allow these things to happen? It's so that people will become concerned, that they will see. I mean, the, the Puritans had a term for a person who's completely, um, feels completely safe, and doesn't think uh, that, that there's any problems at all. They called it uh, carnal security. Do you think there's anybody in our world that might be in that state? carnal security. 
the people that aren't afraid to do wicked things. You know, um, I just try to look at the news every morning. Um, notice that uh, there was a 12-year-old girl that was abducted and she was killed and her body was thrown into some kind of a, I think a dumpster or receptacle of some kind. And they just found out it was a 15 and a 17-year-old, two brothers that, that did that. They killed her for her bicycle. Do you think that there was any fear of God before their eyes? Do you think they were secure in what they were doing? Do you think they weren't going to be found out? People do wicked things when they are secure, when they think that they're safe in doing it. They wouldn't do it if they thought it was going to um, uh, be dangerous for them. So the idea here is that um, end of the world scenarios can cause people to become afraid. And when they're afraid, it can turn into an opportunity for us to be able to point them to a source of safety, right? We can point them to the Lord Jesus Christ, to the one who is able to protect them. Remember, we looked at the fact that God is a refuge. Uh, God is our fortress. I mean, are we concerned about our own well-being? Are we concerned about our physical well-being? Has the Lord made any promises to us regarding our physical well-being? Okay. And, and do we look to those promises? I mean, hasn't he promised to take care of our needs if we seek first the kingdom of heaven? Hasn't he promised that he's going to be a refuge against our enemies if we simply run to him and make him our refuge and fortress? And has the Lord made any promises to us regarding our souls? And don't we... Don't we hold on to those things? Don't we cling to them? Don't we trust in the Lord for those things so that we know that we're safe? Well, other people want safety too, don't they? Can we point them then to the source of safety, to the place that, that we've found confidence, a you know, place that we've found um, security, I mean, real security? So I think that um, you know, end-of-the-world scenarios can be very useful to us because they can awaken people. That's one of the main things. Now, let's delve into this a little bit deeper. Um, one thing we looked at um, last, let's see, was it last Lord's Day? I think it was last Lord's Day. Uh, if you're going to help somebody in this kind of a situation, uh, does it matter what kind of a person you are? as far as your effectiveness in trying to minister to people like this. Okay, what kind of a person ought you and, and, and myself to be striving to be if we're gonna help people? What's that? Holy, holy people, that's right. Uh, remember the, I, I'm bringing this up because I, I know that many of the things that, that I say in sermons are, are lost as soon as they're said, you know, because we, we just can't remember all that. And I don't know if the Lord expects us to remember every single thing, but when important things come up, it's good to review them so that we might remember them. Well, I was thinking about what J.C. Ryle had to say as far as the kind of preachers that he raised up during the Great Awakening in England and how they had this conviction of the reality of the truth of things. We're talking about holiness. We're actually talking about a real large uh, package of things. And if we unpack that a little bit, uh, we, we find there's actually several things that go into that. Certainly, it means living a, a, a godly life. It means loving God and your neighbor. But uh, if you are really going to do that in a way that's pleasing to God, okay, you, you obviously have to believe that God exists. And you do have to believe that the well-being of your neighbor depends on whether or not they receive the gospel. There has to be a deep conviction in your own heart that these things are true. Even if you can't convince them of the truth of what you're saying, J.C. Ryle said, at least send them away uh, understanding that you are convinced that those things are true. I mean, does that make a difference in the people you talk to, doesn't it? They may not acknowledge it right then. They might get upset. They might yell at you and so forth. But if you have this kind of resolve and a deep-seated conviction that these things are true, it's going to impact them, and they're going to think about it once the, in, the encounter is over and they've gone back to where they are. So he said, have this conviction. At least convince them that you are convinced these things are true. He said, speak from your heart to their heart, the word of faith with faith, the story of life with life. Show them that you believe it and that you care about them. 
I mean, we are supposed to love our neighbors ourselves. You're not supposed to stand up on a big pedestal and, and think of the most uh, you know, uh, convicting and condemning thing you can think of to try to drive them into the ground. You're, you're trying to bring them to Christ. Everything we do is to be motivated by love. So personal character has, um, is very important. If we are to be effective in coming to people who may be concerned that the end of the world is coming, and so the Lord has kind of awakened them up, uh, we need to come to them with some conviction. We need to come to them with some concern for their souls. We need to come to them with love and share the gospel with them. Now, here's an interesting question. What if the danger, uh, what if the danger isn't real? You know, we already know that these end of, the, end of the world scenarios are not real. Okay, we already know, this is something we just reviewed for a moment before you got here, but we, we know that there are several things that have to take place, uh, what, what the Lord says in His Word, have to take place, such as, um, you know, there has to be people gathered from every nation, tongue, kindred, and so forth, kingdom of heaven has to fill the earth. Uh, his enemies need to be subdued before he can come. So he cannot come uh, right away, right? Uh, so we know that these end of the world scenarios cannot be true. We know that the world is not going to end. Now, do you have to deal with that before you deal with the real concerns of their souls? In other words, do you have to alleviate their concern because you know that isn't going to take place. Let me just give you a, a kind of a what if, okay? I mean, it wasn't too long ago that Harold Camping was predicting the end of the world. Was it, was it October the 12th or something like that? Hmm? Oh, October the 21st, okay. Now, I hope you understood the end of the world wasn't coming on October the 21st. But there's a bunch of people maybe that are concerned that the end of the world is coming <laughs> on October the 21st. So what do you do? Do you come up and tell them, don't worry, the world isn't going to come to an end and prove it to them and alleviate all their concerns? Is that what we should do first? What do you think? The end of the world may come from them. Yeah, well, I suppose it could, yes. Um, <laughs> but first, we need to be sure they get it all. Okay. Even though they may not have anything to fear from that, the fear that they do have may actually still help you as you tell them about the things that they really should be afraid of, which is the fact, okay, well, if the world does come, an end, come to an end, are you ready? Are you ready to face God as your judge? Are you ready to stand before Him in, in judgment? Okay. If somebody believes that they are in real danger, I think you can certainly point them to the fact that they are in danger aren't they? It may not be from that, but they are in danger and they do need the Lord Jesus Christ. And um, you know, I think you can use that. I think, again, why does the Lord allow it to happen in the first place? Now, what happens if, okay, you, you talk to them about um, the gospel and, and uh, maybe it appears very hopeful that they've trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. What should you do with regard to the end of the world scenario? Should you tell them about it, you know, as far as yeah, I think we should tell them, but I think we should also tie it to what we've already seen regarding the Lord's faithfulness, the fact that He's not going to allow the world to end until He has gathered together all of His people from every nation under heaven. And, um, you know, that to tell them that and, you know, to tie it to the fact that, that God is in control, I think we can do that, and that um, he will also, by, by his grace, faithfully bring them to heaven. Of course, that's if they repent and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what if you've shared the gospel with them and um, they don't repent? Do you uh, think you should alleviate their concerns regarding the end of the world? That was an interesting question. Do you feel like we're, we're bound by the Lord to, uh, to tell them the truth about that or, or not? <laughs> Leave them in their fear and maybe stew for a little while longer. The next person might get to him. Yeah, the next person might get to him. Well, that's, that's possible. Yeah, certainly. Uh, I don't know that um, 
if the Lord has brought this about for that reason, that we necessarily need to alleviate their fears. If they're not going to accept the truth, then we don't necessarily maybe need to tell them the truth about that particular scenario. But um, again, I certainly would continue to enforce the thing that they really have to be afraid of, and that is the Lord. If they happen to believe the world is still coming to an end, then I would continue to press the fact that they need to be ready to face the Savior. Okay. Now let's see. Uh, okay, now here's another question. Is everybody in the world afraid of the end of the world uh, is going to come in their lifetime? Does everybody think it's going to happen? A lot of people do, but is everybody? Not everybody. Okay. Uh, what if you don't have an end of the world scenario to get them concerned? Okay. Uh, what should you do? How can you get them concerned? Everybody knows they're going to die, that's right. And what do they have to be afraid of with regard to death? Yeah, judgment. And why should they be afraid of judgment? Because they're going to have to pay the penalty for their sins and they have to trust in their Lord. Ah, okay. And then how are we going to show them that they have sinned? That's right. The Lord has actually given to us, I mean, besides end of the world, you know, fears that come up and uh, disease that also makes people concerned about their lives when they're faced with death or the funerals that people have to attend, you know, when they realize, well, yes, life does come to an end, but everybody's life is going to end. And I think, well, the Lord has given to us a very useful tool to try to help us. As a matter of fact, uh, there's a ministry that's even based on that where it almost seems like they've just newly discovered it. It's like a new means of evangelism, and yet it's the kind of evangelism that has been going on since, well, since the Lord actually revealed His law to show people their need of Christ, and that is simply pointing out to people what it is that God actually requires and what it is that they have done and what it is that God threatens for the breaking of His commandments. So, I mean, this, as a matter of fact, um, you know that there's a memorial service this upcoming Friday, and a majority of the people who are coming to it, um, uh, family members and so forth, do not know the Lord. And so as I'm thinking about what would I say to a group of people like that, well, what, what else can you tell them except you've broken God's law and you need to repent and trust in Jesus, right? So how can I help them understand, though, what sin is except by explaining the law. I mean, sin is lawlessness. And try to do it in a way that, and I think this would probably be fairly helpful, I, I think, for all of us to do. Uh, most people, when they read about or read the Ten Commandments and uh, learn what they say, don't really understand why God may, may not like this or that. You know, I mean, for instance, the Seventh Commandment, how many people today would, would uh, gripe at that? You should not commit adultery. I mean, everybody seems to be going out of their way to commit adultery. Well, why would God say that this is wrong? I mean, to me, it seems like a good thing. I mean, they might say something like that. Well, I think you can point out to them that adultery not only offends God, but it hurts other people. It hurts everyone who's involved in it, okay? It, it, all, everything that God tells us not to do is a sin against a very foundational principle that the Lord actually calls us to do. And most people, I think, would acknowledge this. You know, most people who don't understand the law of God understand and would agree that the golden rule is one that should be followed. You know, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Treat other people the way you want to be treated and so forth. And what that simply is saying is, is this, that God wants us to love others the way that we want to be loved. Uh, Jesus even summarizes the commandments, doesn't he, by saying the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Now, why is God so angry when we don't do that? Well, because when we don't, we're not only uh, you know, hating him and offending him, but we're also hating and injuring other people. We are sinning against love, at least what, what love really is. So that's what God wants us to do, and I think... Um, if you explain it in that way, it doesn't become like these 10 arbitrary rules. 
that God wants us to keep, but it's simply that God wants us to love and honor him because he is worthy and to love other people the way that we would want to be loved. So that's the reasonableness of the law of God, and it shows why God gets angry over the fact that um, people break that commandment or break, break the law of love because they're not loving him and they're not loving other people. And actually what all they're doing is loving themselves to, at the expense of everyone else. I mean, sin is selfishness. Sin is seeking what you want at the expense of other people. But of course we know as Christians that the true way to love ourselves is to love God and to love other people because that's when we will be most greatly blessed uh, by the Lord. So anyway, use the law. Tell them about God's rule and, and if, you know, if the Lord gives you opportunity, explain to them why it is he desires these particular things. Apply it to them that they have broken it, they have hated God, they have hated other people and uh, have injured them. Tell them the consequences of breaking the law. I mean, what are the wages of sin? Death. death. What kind of death? Physical death and then something much worse than that, right? Okay, eternal death, uh, damnation. Tell them that there's a day of judgment coming in which everything that they've done is going to be weighed in the balances and every one of those sins is going to weigh them down into hell. You see, these things can, by God's grace, awaken a person to their danger, even like end of the world scenarios can do. As a matter of fact, when John the Baptist came out preaching, he didn't come out preaching, the end of the world is here, you know, therefore get ready. But instead, he, he did say the Messiah is coming, you better get ready. But what he used to get them ready and what he used to get them concerned was God's law. So he began saying to the crowds who were going out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore bear fruits in keeping with repentance and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham for our father. For I say to you that from these stones, God is able to raise up children to Abraham. Indeed, the ax is already laid at the root of the trees. So every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Basically, John the Baptist was speaking to a predominantly Jewish audience, although there were Roman soldiers, and the Roman soldiers said, what should we do? And others were saying, what should we do? He was saying, you need to basically repent of your sins. Look at what God requires and realize that if you don't, there is one coming after me who is going to judge you. Okay? Be ready to receive him as your Savior, but if you don't, you're going to perish in the judgment. So anyway, John the Baptist used the doctrines of God's law. He used the fact they needed to repent. He used judgment. He used the fact that judgment is near. The ax is already laid at the base of the tree. And if you're not bearing good fruit, you're going to be cut down. So you need to repent and bring forth the fruits of repentance. Now, I hope you understand, too, that that's what we saw in the Great Awakening. There was no end of the world scenario there either, but there was preaching that was calculated to awaken people. And again, this is how Edwards described it. Maybe you'll recall this from uh, this past Sunday evening. When he's talking about preaching, he says, they ought indeed to be thorough in preaching the word of God without mincing the matter at all. In handling the sword of the spirit as ministers of the Lord of hosts, they ought not to be mild and gentle. They are not to be gentle and moderate and searching and awakening the conscience, but should be sons of thunder the word of God, which is in itself sharper than a two-edged sword, ought not to be sheathed by its ministers, but so used that its sharp edges may have their full effect, even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. Basically, pull out that sword and start hewing away. Now, that raises an interesting question because... Now, Edwards here was talking about preaching. He was talking about the kind of preaching that the ministers ought to be doing to awaken those slumbering souls to their need of Jesus Christ. Does that mean that when you come up to an individual and you witness one-on-one, -on -one, that that's what you should do? I mean, how should it be moderated, or should it be? Should you just go at them, you know? Is friendship evangelism different than preaching? Right? It can be, right? It can be. But you still need to bring the message across, but I think your mannerism, your tone, 
The Lord doesn't necessarily want you to set up a podium and, or a pulpit and, or a soapbox or whatever it may be and get up on top of it and begin to preach down at them. I think sometimes we think that that's what the Lord wants us to do. But when we're sharing with people one-on-one, -on -one, our demeanor is going to be a little bit different. It might be different when we share the gospel at a wedding. You know, if a couple's getting married um, and there's unbelievers in the audience, do you begin to just lay the law of God on them and, and warn them of coming judgment? You know, it, it may not fit very well in the context of what's going on. You do have to be sensitive, but the message still needs to get across, doesn't it? The message needs to get across to the point where people feel it. Now, again, you might make it as sharp as you possibly can and try to drive it home as strong as you can, but there's somebody else that needs to be involved. Otherwise, it's not going to have much of an effect. And who is that? the Holy Spirit, which is why we pray and we seek that God would work through his gospel. So end of the world scenarios can be useful because they can do a very big part of the job. I mean, they can make people concerned for their lives. And that's really what the law of God does as well. But if you find them already afraid for their lives, that can actually help you to, uh, uh, well, to, to get in there with the gospel to begin to uh, work along with that fear that they have to show them what they really should be afraid of. And when, by God's grace, that fear is worked within them, perhaps the Lord will use it to bring them to the Savior. Again, is, is anyone going to come to the Savior unless they see their need of him? You know, is somebody going to, uh, if there's a bottle of medicine on the counter, um, are they just going to open up the, the bottle of medicine and take the medicine because it's there? No, they, they need to understand their need of the medicine. You know, they have to understand that they're sick before they're actually going to come and take it. Again, the life preserver, same thing. If you throw a person life preserver on land, they're not going to, pay, they're not going to take it. They're going to think you're crazy. But if they're drowning at sea, They'll do everything they can to reach out for it because they know their danger and they know this can save them. Same thing with Jesus Christ. Unless they know their danger and see that he is a savior that can save them from that danger, they're not going to reach out to take, take hold of him and trust him. So that's the purpose of awakening. That's, that's how end of the world scenarios can help us. I think that's why the Lord actually uh, allows these things to take place um, is so that he will awaken people. And by the way, not everything that happens in this world is necessarily something that isn't a concern. If something that isn't necessarily the end of the world is, is going to happen, um, I mean, the Lord could bring it for other reasons. He could bring it for judgment. But again, it's whatever it is, the Lord is going to use it to advance his kingdom. So again, the, the point here is when you find somebody who is concerned, try to use that concern to lead them to Christ. Um, we really do need, again, to be praying that the Lord would make us willing to do that so that when we actually do find somebody like that, we'll take advantage of that opportunity. If the Lord brings somebody across your path like that and you're aware of it and you have the opportunity to share with them, who brought you that opportunity? Who brought that person to you? Who made them concerned? who gave you the gospel to actually share with them. And what does he want you to do? He wants you to share with them. And so that's something that we always need to be on the alert for. We need to be looking for those opportunities that the Lord in his faithfulness is providing for us, uh, maybe not on a daily basis. I mean, there are opportunities to glorify him on a daily basis, maybe not to share the gospel. Or maybe there is, depends on your, on your vocation. Depends on where you are. Uh, but um, when they come, be ready for them. Because if you're not, then they're going to pass you by. And not only is that person, well, there are some pretty heavy things we can look at regarding letting opportunities go by. Um, that may be the last opportunity that person has. You never know. Again, uh, you know, Mike Stockhausen came to the service and heard the gospel, and that may have been his very last opportunity. It was certainly, he passed away only a few weeks later. You just never know. 
when the Lord is going to call people out of the world. So if you have an opportunity, buy up the opportunity. The Lord tells us, make the best of every opportunity to bring a gospel witness. So let's, let's bow in a moment of prayer. And oh, I should ask, are there any questions about that first? Any questions or comments? Okay, then let's, let's uh, pray that the Lord will give us um, those opportunities and that we'll be able to make the most of them. And let's also pray he'll bless our prayer time this evening.